Hey folks, how's everybody doing out there? In last week's video, we took a tour of the 7-bit ASCII character set, a system created in the 1960s to work with mechanical teleprinters in the United States, which has gone on to become the dominant international standard for encoding text in computer systems. And we left things off around about here. 1965, the American Standards Association, they've published the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, ASCII, which works brilliantly if you're in America using American English on an American computer, and the rest of the world has gone, sorry, what? Well, not quite the rest of the world. It turns out there were a lot of places where American English worked just fine. I grew up in Zimbabwe in the 1980s. Uh, English was one of Zimbabwe's three official languages alongside Shona and Ndebili, and uh, the Zimbabwean currency was the dollar. And yes, the story of the Zimbabwe dollar, that will definitely show up in a future video. But as far as young Dylan was concerned, computers worked just fine. Then, when I was about 10 years old, I uh, moved to the UK with my family, and uh, we got a 286 PC with a megabyte of RAM, and it had a, a 9-pin dot matrix printer, and one day I used the computer to write an essay for school, and I went to print it out, and I discovered that I couldn't print the pound sign. Incidentally, uh, this, this is the pound sign. Uh, this thing here, that's a hash, or an octothorpe if you're feeling classy. But never a pound. Anyway, it turns out that the currency symbol for pounds sterling was one of the many, many symbols used around the world which didn't make the cut when the American Standards Association chose their 127 ASCII characters. Which, as yeah, fair enough, it is the American Standard Code after all. And in some places, the UK, Scandinavia, France, Germany, ASCII was, uh, was kind of usable, you know, it was almost good enough. For a lot of other places, Greece, Russia, China, Japan, Israel, ASCII was not even close. And so what happened next is a whole bunch of people all over the world, they look at ASCII and they go, hang on, there's eight bits in a byte and ASCII only uses seven of them. What about this part? Is anybody using this? And so we enter one of the most gloriously chaotic epochs in the history of computing, code pages. A code page basically says that right here, right now, on this device, when this document is open in this application, here is what all the codes in the top half of the extended ASCII character set look like. And yes, every single caveat in that explanation is there for a reason. The reason I couldn't print my homework was that my PC was using a different code page than my printer. You might open a document that worked yesterday and discover that you couldn't read it today. For the uh, you know relatively few people who were online using email or bulletin board systems in the 1970s and the 1980s, if your text file included Hebrew or Greek or Russian, there was no guarantee that anybody else would be able to read it. And if you wanted to mix different alphabets in the same document, your best bet was to print them out separately and staple the pages together afterwards. Now, one particularly infamous code page was code page 437. This was the default code page on the very first IBM PC, personal computer. Code page 437 extended basic ASCII with most of the extended character used in Northern and Western Europe. So it covered Germany, France, Sweden. Uh, the Norwegians and the Danes, they had to use the Swedish alphabet, but it was still better than the American alphabet, right? There were a bunch of box drawing characters so you could make funky MS-DOS menu systems, and there was about half of the Greek alphabet, because the IBM folks had decided that a box drawing was more important than being able to read and write in Greek, but mathematics and physics, that was still a pretty big deal for a home computer. And so code page 437, it basically included all of the Greek characters that you'd find in a high school physics textbook. Then they did something I think is neat. Somebody pointed out that the IBM PC was not in fact a mechanical teleprinter and that maybe they could use that bottom block of codes there to add another 32 characters. And so we got smiley faces and playing card symbols and arrowheads. Now, if you've ever seen an original IBM PC crash really hard, you get a screen full of smiley faces and playing cards. Because that's all of those bytes of memory with low values in them being dumped to standard output using that default code page. Now, 
There was another problem with code pages. The code page people, they weren't the only people who wanted to use that eighth bit for something. A lot of networks would use the eighth bit of a byte as a parity check. Uh, to this day, SMTP, it's the protocol that runs internet email, that is still a seven bit encoding. Uh, WordStar, one of the most popular word processors of the early 1980s, uh, that would use the high bit as a flag to denote that this character was the last letter of a word. Um, this apparently made it much faster to do things like word counts and spell checking, but it also meant if you opened a file in WordStar that used a code page and then you saved it, boom, now you have a file full of garbled nonsense. There were a couple of standardized code pages for writing Cyrillic. It's the alphabet used in Russia, Ukraine, Bulgaria, actually in way more countries than you might think. So if you used uh, the standard code page 866 to say hello in Russian, Privet, and then you open that up in WordStar and that top bit gets cleared, what you get out is garbled nonsense. But there was another code page, the Kod Obnema Informatia Vosimbit, KOI8. Now, KOI8 was really clever because it didn't map code points based on Cyrillic alphabetical order. Instead, it mapped them to the Latin letters, which kind of sounded the same. And it mapped lowercase Cyrillic to uppercase Latin and vice versa. So if you encode Privyat in KOI8 and then you lose all your high bits, what you get at the other end is vanilla ASCII that sort of makes sense if you read it out loud, Privyat. And it's obvious that it's been mangled in translation because all of the capitalization here has been reversed. Now, a lot of the material in this little series of videos, it comes from talks that I've done at conferences over the years. And a couple of years ago, uh, somebody came up to me after one of those talks and asked me, did I know about the Harry Potter book? And they told me about the most wonderful story. Now, some of the details here, they are lost to history. And the details that aren't lost to history mostly came from Reddit. So I filled in the gaps with a little bit of artistic license. But uh, around 2002, uh, there's a lady in Moscow who is on some kind of Harry Potter fan site. Uh, we know her name, Svetlana, and uh, she's emailing another Harry Potter fan who lives in Paris, who uh, we're gonna call Claudette. Now, the new Harry Potter book has just come out, but it isn't available in Russia yet. So uh, Claudette says to Svetlana, hey, do you want me to send it to you? And uh, Sveta replies, yes, that would be amazing. Here is my address. Uh, it's in Russian alphabet, so please copy it carefully. And then there is the address of an apartment building in Moscow. But when Claudette opens the email on her French language version of Windows 2000, it looks like this. Now remember, this is the same message, same data. It's the same underlying codes, but it is being rendered using a different code page. So it comes out in a different alphabet. And Claudette goes, well, hey, I guess that's how they write addresses in Russia. And so she very diligently copies it out exactly and writes Russi at the bottom. And the package makes it as far as Russia. And then some incredibly enterprising person in the Russian postal service, they look at it and they go, hang on, I know this. And they translate all of those code points back into Cyrillic. And uh, Sveta gets her Harry Potter book. Now. I'd like you folks to get your phone out or, you know, open up Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, whatever it is that you use to listen to streaming music. And I want you to search for this word, Kohuept, K-O-H-U-E-P-T. Find anything? Yep. Billy Joel, live in Leningrad. You see, in 1987, uh, Billy Joel and his band became one of the first Western artists to perform live in the Soviet Union, the USSR. And they made a recording of that concert, which was released around the world, including in the Soviet Union. It was a live album called Concert. And the album title was written in the Russian Cyrillic alphabet. K -o -n -t -c -i -r -t. Now, this is 1987, so I've no idea whether Columbia Records was even keeping computerized records at the time or not. But eventually, at some point, some data entry person found themselves staring at the word concert written in Cyrillic and looking at their US ASCII computer keyboard layout and going, okay, K, O, H, uh, guess that's a U, E, P, T. I mean, no big deal, right? It's just an internal database for stock control and stuff, right? 
And then at some point, the internet comes knocking and it says to all the record companies, hey, we've invented this thing called streaming. Uh, do you have a big database of all of your songs anywhere that we can use? And the next thing you know, Kohuept by Billy Joel is on all of the major streaming platforms. And that's just how the world is now. So we got a bunch of code pages based on alphabetical order. We've got KOI8, which is based on phonetics. It's based on what things sound like. Uh, we got Kohuept, which is not really an encoding, but it's what you get if you try and map one alphabet onto another based on what the letters look like. And I want to leave you with one more thing, which is also not an encoding, but it is another way of mapping one alphabet onto another that is used by probably millions of people every day without realizing it. If you don't read Russian, this won't mean anything to you. If you do read Russian, this also won't mean anything to you because if it's a shaye, it doesn't mean anything. It, it's, it's nonsense. But if you type this onto a standard Cyrillic keyboard layout, this is the pattern that your fingers make. And if you'd remembered to switch your keyboard layout back to US English before you typed that pattern, you'd have typed the words Taylor Swift. And this happens so often that Google actually figures it out. And it knows that if you Google F and you were probably looking for Tay and you just forgot to switch your keyboard layout over. Folks, that is all for this time. Uh, tune in next time where we're going to talk about Francois the archaeologist. We're going to hear about what happened the first time Motley Crue went on tour in Germany. I'm going to talk about Zalgo text. I'm going to find out why people with Swedish passports have to be careful when they buy American airline tickets. In the meantime, you folks, you take it easy out there. You have a good week. Look after each other and I will catch all of you next time.